start with a fun one because I was very amused right off the bat with the Jason Takes Manhattan Easter egg. So which uh, devious puppeteer was responsible for that inside joke? It's like Ghostface Takes Manhattan. Take that, Jason. I think it, you know, it's funny. It was really serendipitous, actually. We we kept making jokes, obviously, from like the first time we read the script. Jason Takes Manhattan was a part of just like the conversation, but we never had a place for it in the movie to actually call it out. And then that what you're talking about, we got we got a list of movies from Paramount that they own that we could use in the movie. And the second we saw that one, we were like, oh, there it is. It all just fell into place. The <laughs> lowest hanging fruit. And oftentimes you don't want to pick the lowest hanging fruit because it feels like too obvious. And yeah. then you see it and, and then you go, well, there's no better choice. And we were kind of hoping it would let like people who know it, you know, it's like because we don't call it out specific, but if you get it, you get it. And it kind of lets you know that you're in for a fun ride. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I also wanted to talk about. There are so many moments that speak directly to what fans have been clamoring for forever, but then there's a lot of moments where I feel like you go, we know this is what you want, but we're not going to give it to you for the sake of the story's integrity. How did you find that line between both? I think you just have to, I think you just have to treat it all really honestly. Uh, like the, the, the chase sequences, like treat those as honestly as you treat the quiet character moments and protect, protect them, like protect the integrity of them. I think, you know, in a movie that has so many kind of high octane moments, it's really easy. I think it'd be really easy to watch it and go, ah, it's starting to slow down because you have these like emotional scenes and like, let's just get to the next action scene. And, and for us, it was actually really about um, protecting that stuff. And then, and then also protecting the integrity of the action sequences. I think there's there's a, an inclination to just like rush, rush through everything. And I, for this, it was really about just um, creating, creating a, a peaks and valleys so that the movie feels like it's, it's, yeah, it's like on the rise, but that it's also really sort of frantic and frenetic throughout and, um, and really just calibrating that. That way we spent yeah. a lot of time in the edit, just calibrating that. And also hats off to the studios, like, you know, Spyglass and Paramount, nobody, we, we, we have so much muscle memory of these experiences of getting told to cut things down, but nobody ever suggested cutting down the emotional stuff, which is, I think why it stays. So it's so intact. Uh, so much of this, I feel like is in conversation with Scream 2, but it's also meta because I feel like what you guys endured making this movie kind of spoke to what Wes was dealing with then as far as, you know, the fan base and wanting to know everything and trying to preserve secrecy. Did you ever anticipate or expect that, uh, that it would kind of be like time is a flat circle here? <laughs> I think that you're aware of it. We're always aware. Yeah. Of it. I think that we're always surprised by the, the level of investment and the degree of that investment. Um, and look, some of it's some of it's really like shitty and unfortunate, but the vast majority of it is amazing, right? You have a fan base that holds these movies and us to to such a crazy high standard. That is a that is a blessing. That's why the movies are great. And and I think trying to achieve trying to make stuff for that audience is it's an honor. It's it yeah. it really truly is. What kind of challenges did that? I mean, because it is <laughs> insane. And I you know even then before internet before social media you know, Wes had a hard time preserving this, the secrecy and the mysteries. So what did you have to deal with now in a social media age? I mean, to be totally honest, at a certain point, you just have to go, we can't control this. Like, you know, yeah. it is what it is. All we can do is the best job that we can do. And if we let our heads get too far in that kind of direction, it can just go off the rails. So we really have to like, kind of check each other and go like, all right, What's, whatever's going to happen is going to happen and we just have to be good with it. But I think also at the end of the day, the, the aim is to make something that isn't about one moment or one reveal or one spoiler, right? Like that, that it's, um, it's a, it's, it's everything around those things that typically, you know, get spoiled or people are sharing, like it's the movie as a whole is, is the aim. Like it's the experience yeah. of it. Cause even I, you know, it, it is, it is our dream that after you've seen the movie, that it's compelling enough, entertaining enough, interesting enough that you want to revisit it anyway. Re even if you know and when you know what the outcome is, what happens and so on and so forth, you still want to go back and have the experience again. That is that is the goal for yeah, us. That is the as possible. I think you nailed it. Um, 
I'd yeah. also be <laughs> remiss to not talk about or ask about the gore, the kills. This is a sequel. It's bigger and better. I also noticed that you thanked Josh and Sierra Russell, who are great with gore. So I was curious if you touch on on kind of like the the ruthlessness of Ghostface and how you kind of played it and invented some of these elaborate kind of kills. Uh, yeah, well, really quick about Josh and Sierra. That was fun. They, I, they're another little fun Easter egg. They're in the commercial in the background. They did a little fake commercial for us. You can see them for about two and a half seconds. I think you can hear Josh speak for a second. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, and you know, they they are incredible. And then, and for, but for the movie, it was, it was really this idea of like, let's just go full tilt the other direction after screen five and make this like bonkers bananas, you know, borderline over the top. Some might say over the top, uh, but really just go for it and have fun with those things. And, you know, like to what we were talking about earlier with the character stuff, those two things are so tied, you know, and the the more you love the characters, the, the higher the stakes are for the, the set pieces. And it was really important to us, to Guy and Jamie, to really make sure that those two things always elevated each other throughout the movie. And, you know, hopefully that's how it ends up working out. I think it was also really taking, taking uh, pains to make sure that, the locations were really influencing like what was yeah. scary about the sequences that we were never cutting corners that, and in, and in fact, sometimes designing like redesigning sets so that there was one more opportunity for a, a different kind of scare or a different kind of thrill that it wasn't just get here and then have them, you know, win, lose, die, survive. Like it was, a, it's about the sort of stacking of one obstacle on top of another, on top of another, which is I like Kevin and Wes, I think for us are are the masters of that of that sense of rising action, and we wanted to make sure that it, you really felt that in those sequences. 